All right, what is going on, everyone? Welcome back to another Serious Angler podcast. As always, I'm your host, Bailey Eigbrett, and joined with me is Mr. Andy Full, the captain. And uh, tonight we have no deacon with us, but as always, we're joined by the great Mr. Adam Bartuzic. What's going on, boys? Just trying to stay awake, you know, <laughs> living the dream. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty tired. I'm catching up on dinner after fishing a tournament this weekend. We can finally bass fish in Minnesota again, so life is good. Heck yeah. So, Andy, really quick, I mentioned in my introduction, probably more out of force of habit, uh, but I said, as always, um, but, dude, you killed it last week, rocking it solo for Monday Night Live while my butt was in Iowa for work. You know, but I brought my uh... – the best game I could kind of doing it on the spot and trying to make it happen. And we made it happen. So we didn't have to miss a week. So exactly the things we do for the folks. Yes. The things we do. <laughs> you I'm, killed it, but uh, we'll uh, today is going to be strictly about Lake Gunnersville. We're going to touch upon Neely Henry here real quick, but uh, I got a lot of stuff. I like to tell the folks and we're going to tell them tomorrow night on um, Monday night live. Uh, we got a whole bunch of stuff that we're going to catch up on. But tomorrow night, we're, we're actually going to have on Caleb Bell, a uh, good buddy of ours down in Tennessee, to talk about post-spawn fish moving off the bed, how to follow them, find them once they move off, that sort of jazz. But uh, I think first thing that we should touch upon uh, is Neely Henry. Um, I don't know how much you guys watched with it, but shout out to our boy uh, Wes Logan for getting his first ever blue trophy, which is was pretty damn cool to watch. Hometown uh, dude, boy, yeah, dude. It's really cool because you see, you see a lot of guys win blue, blue trophies, obviously, but there's something different about guys that win their first, and then hometown guys, the guys that went on their home turf, like Ali winning on, winning on four, West winning on Neely, and it was also Wes's first, or Bill Lowen's first. Um, that's pretty damn cool. But Heck yeah, do you guys have any uh, first thing that comes to mind when watching the the Neely Henry derb? Um, what do you guys have as certain, you know, like a hot take or what are you guys thoughts? Well, so I was there for the event. So I apologize to everyone for another delayed Thursday. I'm done going to the elite series this year. I just bring Brad weather. Um, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. But uh, anyways, I wrote, so the one thing I will say, they probably talked about it on TV and live all the time was uh, how the river like curves so Minnesota hard. bend, yeah. That the the water is literally five feet high and five feet low at the bottom. Um, like I'm here to tell you that is so true. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, you're you'll literally be going and driving, and all of a sudden you can feel like your boat's going slightly uphill for a while. It's wicked. Wild. It's like you'll go into a creek and you'll feel yourself come down, and then you come back out and go up. It's so it, weird. It sounds like a wave pool. It, it dude, it kind of is. Like you get around some of the points, and like it's it's bucket. That's so weird. <laughs> it is a bizarre place, man. Like I was driving Scott Martin's camera boat on day one, and uh, I rode around with Felix one day too. It's just so weird, like being on on the same body of water, right, and mm. like fifteen to twenty minutes apart in a run. And, like, in one spot, you're watching a guy just flip in a dock, whatever, and then you literally run 20 minutes, and there's a guy, like, he can't fish under the dock because it's literally dry land under the dock. <laughs> it's insane. Dude, crazy. I was talking to Wes a couple of days ago, and that's what he mentioned was, like, there are certain parts of the river that would be so much higher. Like, one part of the river would be rising, the other part would be falling. And this is where that home field advantage comes into play because Wes mentioned he's like, he's like, yeah, dude, I live 30 minutes away. Like, it's probably, that's probably where I spent my most time in Alabama. And uh, so he mentioned he's like, he would see what the water was doing and he would understand. He was like, okay, I, there might be, this place might be flooded and it has that, you know, basically what they were fishing was like, what it was eelgrass, right? That's essentially what they were fishing. Um, yeah. I believe I don't. I think it's called water willow. Was it water willow? Yeah, they were fishing water willow. Okay, it looked like eelgrass to me, but whatever. Uh, basically, what the point was is he's saying he found areas where that was submerged, 
where it wouldn't be as efficient. Uh, so when the water was falling in certain areas, then he'd go fish it when, once it was exposed, when those fish would move up more further into it. Whereas if it's all submerged, they'd be a little bit deeper into it or deeper off of that, that edge. Um, and like he knew that there are certain areas coming up, meaning that there might have been completely dried willow. And as soon as it comes up, those fish are going to push up into it. And that was kind of like how he followed the fish. But um, one thing I asked him too was like everyone was throwing white swim jigs, white buzz baits, and he was the only one that had a black and blue swim jig. And he just goes, "There's no reason. He's just I was just throwing it because everyone was throwing white." I yeah, and black and blue still works really well in muddy water as well. People think big and white, yeah, they're eating gizzard shads or whatever the forage is there, but there's still going to be shell crackers and brim and crappie around that black and blue is going to play in that darker darker water. So whatever. Yeah. And like a lot of people think like, you know what they say is like muddy water when it's sunny, you throw white. When it's overcast, you throw black and blue. But I, I don't think it really matters as much. Because like especially like you just mentioned, if there's shell crackers and stuff, if you're matching that forage, that's it's still gonna work. And confidence, know? everything's confidence. Right. right. And that that was just it was super interesting. Um, but yeah, Bart, any other takeaways from the event? Well, the the way the like on the swim jig note, the way he, the way those Alabama guys like have the Alabama shake with their swim jig. A swim jig bite for them is much more of a reactionary bite than it is a swim jig bite for other people hmm. by the way they work their bait. So right. having a dark profile there in dirty water almost, you know, seems really good, you know? Yeah, because it goes back to more of a feeding bite rather than a reactionary bite with that big white swim jig. Like Swindle was throwing it and shaking it like a six inches underneath the surface. You could see his bait coming and one would eat it. And that'd be the reactionary style to it. As for that more natural, like brim shell cracker bite, you might actually get the more re like natural instinct out of the fish because one, nobody sees it. And two, it's just, it could be what they're feeding on that water will at that time. Yeah. Uh, really quick going on swindle. I was going to mention this in the show, but our show, our preview show for Neely was going for a while. Um, I actually had gotten sidetracked and forgot to mention this, but I have it in text still with uh, our buddy Zach Hall. And I said, what? I said, I said, hot take, Gerald Swindle wins his first lead event. And goddamn, he was very close to making that happen. I really <laughs> thought Swindle was going to win the damn thing. It was funny. When it flooded out, I was like, this is going to be a Swindle event because it's going to be junk fishing. You'll figure it out on like day two or three. That was my exact thought. I was like, he's going to catch him on a buzz bait. And then he starts cracking him on a buzz bait. And I was like, all right. He did yeah. that a couple of years ago at um, that one Texas Lake, Texoma. I think it was with the popper and everyone's like, where did he, was it Texoma part that I'm thinking of? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, it was, I think it was Texoma and he was catching him doing something completely different than everybody else. He was fishing like flooded grass with a popper and the water was like 12 foot high. Um, <laughs> I want to say it was Texoma. Thought, the, one of the things I thought that's kind of crazy. If you think about this is, um, did you know three of the top ten were from Minnesota? So what? Thirty-three percent. Oh yeah, Downey yeah. had a great derby. Spider, Downey, and Austin Who? Felix. Was Felix in? Did yeah. Felix? Yeah, he finished like tenth. Yeah. Oh no, he didn't. No, he finished better than that because Todd Otten was tenth. So I had mm. Todd. I didn't realize Felix was in the top ten again. That's right? the second, that's Quietly, the second. like, there was three Alabamans and three Minnesotans. Is that what it was? Yeah. Well, Spider, I mean, Felix high Ron water, Ron. grass, swim jig, <coughs> Min Mississippi River vibes. Am I wrong? But yeah, I mean, we don't catch them on, like, a buzz bait and a swim jig. But, yeah, like, it looked like what they were doing junk fishing-wise was, yeah, they looked comfortable doing it. Except Felix was not doing that. Felix was throwing a shaky hat at the bottom end of the lake on a point. Or he was throwing top water one or two of the days. 
such an offshore nut. There's, yeah, yeah. Dude, it was so sick. The most bizarre, weird things, and they're always deeper than everybody else. Watching Seth throw a swim jig is a lot of fun. Yeah. That's Dude, what's awesome. him like? Because everyone talks about how good he is with smallies and, like, obviously, you know, certain things. But, like, watching Seth, like, go fish docks, like, w- when he's fishing grass. So, like, he's, like, flipping grass around and just, like, going around docks and everything. It's just, like, music. It's unreal, mm-hmm. dude. It's so just smooth. And you're just, mm-hmm. like, watching him go and just pick. And then, like, when his hook set on a jig bite is so wicked. Like, look at his replays and everything. Like, he flips it out, and his arm's, like, bent 45, and it's literally just all of a sudden whack. And it's it's just so cool. And it, Yeah, and he's a braid guy, too, on most applications, too. Like, he's a braid deleter, ain't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Offshore grass, for sure. I mean, he might have even been doing it with the swim jig. I would have been. Hmm. I think what's cool is, like, they had it on the camera in the morning, and he pulled up the one stretch on a swim jig. And he goes, he goes, I think I got bit here in practice. I don't know if it was a bite, but we're going to find out. And he just goes down, cracks a three-pounder. And he, he gets all excited. He goes, yep, they're here. <laughs> <laughs> confidence like is huge. Like, if you go, like, I think it was a bite. If you have no confidence in it, you're not going to get bit. You're just like, oh, maybe. Yeah, yeah and you're probably going to leave before you even get to the good spot. Yep. Those higher percentage areas. But that, that's, that was really exciting. So one thing that he mentioned, because I talked to him recently, he mentioned his he does not want to get anything figured out in practice. And I thought that was super interesting. He's like, I want to get a gist of where they're at, and I want to figure it out on day one. And I was like, kind of mind blown. Like, all right, you're just a legend. Get out of here. That was <laughs> that's what Seth said. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, he goes, I don't want to be dialed going into the tournament. And I was just kind of like. That's crazy. <laughs> how many times? I mean, that's different for one day event when it's not a one day event. You know, like when you're doing a four day or like, or even a two day, or that's probably smart. Yeah. I just thought, I mean, because how many guys go into it, you know, you see their pre tournament posts and it, they're like showing a giant, say they're dialed, and then they suck. Um, day three. Mm-hmm. And how many guys would be like, oh, I had a shitty practice, uh, and then they're making day four. Yeah. Just figure it out as they go. Well, it's because they just eliminated all the bad water. So That's a fair point. Yeah. <laughs> um, But, no, the only other thing from Neely Henry I had to put in was just, and we kind of touched on it, but, I mean, you just want to mail the – AOI trophy up to New Market, Minnesota, <laughs> or Elko, Minnesota. I apologize. Like, should we just do that now? <laughs> Knew that was coming. It's over. Like, it's okay. done. Sign, seal, uh, game over. Let me pull up. I want to see. Nobody's catching him. Gunnersville, he's taken top 15s every time he's been there, plus classics. He's been really good. And then you go north. And he's not taking – he's not, like, not making the final day on Champlain. And, like, with how he's fishing this year, he might win by four pounds. And then St. Lawrence, he he doesn't, like, ever get in contention to win, but he's normally, like, top 15 to 20. Sometimes he makes the finals day or not. Like, it's not mathematically possible for anyone to catch him. He's got – Here's the only I mean, it only, is if he sucks, but, like, let's right. be real here. He can't afford a bomb. Basically. But, like, let's be real here. Like, we've seen locals and, like, guys bomb on their type of fisheries down south this year. But, like, when those northern guys are up north, they don't bomb. Like, ever. None of them bomb. Yeah. Our fish are way too predictable. That's yeah. what it comes down to. Uh, our waters don't, adjust, uh, don't fluctuate like theirs do. No. Mm-hmm. So he's got Patrick Walters, 41 points behind him. Walters might do well at Gunnersville and maybe inch it closer, depending on how fighter fishes. But, like, he's going to run away at Champlain and St. Lawrence. I don't think Walters will have the same 
Yeah, because he's got to finish the same level or better, and it's like, okay, so you have to win two events up north because that's going to be in the top 15. Here's the only thing I think could possibly happen. Brandon Polonick's in fourth, 60 points behind him. I don't know how Polonick is on Gunnersville, but he's good. Gonna be as long as fighter finishes in the top 20, the remaining events, Obviously, has in the back. I want to say maybe even top thirty. Polonic can't catch him, but if he bombs, there is a chance. If Polonic stays on that train, could make things interesting going into St. Lawrence. What are your guys' thoughts? I think it's done, personally. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's done. Yeah. Like, I just, I literally texted Ronnie. Oh, here, just wait. This is going to be funny because he never replied to it. <laughs> did you get left on red? I did. Oh, where is it? He just deleted it. He saw it come up and he was like, I'm not even reading. Delete. <laughs> I can't I read it. Text me. But, I said, um, I said to him, "You, uh, do you just want to mail it up here now, or you guys just want to send it up?" And he like he just didn't like that very much because it's like, let's be real, like it's just done, like it's done. over, and he didn't <laughs> like it very much. I just can't find exactly what the wording was. <laughs> I think what we should do here let's uh, let's update our fantasy fishing. Um, I asked Deacon, text sent Deacon a text to see if he could. Um, points, but... I'll lead off because I'm betting I took last. Uh, <laughs> uh, I might have you again there, bud. All right, um, well, are we ready to find out? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first here because this is freaking, this is the story of my season. I, I try to be creative and only pick these low percentage, percentage guys. And day one, Josh Strayson is an 18th. Menendez is in 34th. Palmer's in 32nd. Todd Otten's in 6th. Granted, I had Chris Grow in 92nd on day one. The way that, so I was sitting there, I was sitting in 1,000 points. Day two, Straysner drops to 81st. Menendez drops to 80th. Luke Palmer finishes up in 29th, so Palmer went up for a while higher in the standings. Todd Alton stayed in top 10, but placed 10th. And then Grill was at 89th. So I finished out with 802, a whopping 802 points. It's probably the lowest I think I've gotten this year. You did do worse than me. <laughs> I told you I would. <laughs> Bro, I had Strasner. So same thing. You and I had similar picks this week. This is why this happened. Uh, I did have Gussie make the cut, but on day one, my life was looking pretty bad. <laughs> then I had Canterbury take 94th, like, what oh. the heck? Whew. And then Atkins in 64th. Dude, he's having a horrible season. Yeah, but then luckily, I forgot I even had him. I had Paul Mueller. Oh, damn. This is <laughs> a rando pick in Bucket East, so that was nice. And you big bass. But I ended up with 894. Oh, yeah, you still crushed my score. So, Andy, you might have taken the cake this week. 943. So I had Walters, Hamner, who came in 60th, Airy, which was in 5th, and then Jamie Hartman, who finished 25th in Group D, and then Dustin in the great 84th in Group E. Should have went Mueller. If Deacon, I would have had Mueller, uh, it would have been a great. Deacon's got an easy week. If he, uh, I don't know, I can't remember how his team did, but I should oh, just... oh, He just texted us. <laughs> he said, "Let me look." So we'll All find right, out we'll, in a minute. We'll stay updated on what we're going to do here. But I'm pretty goddamn sure that I'm last. So I'm just going to go ahead and add another four points to my name. And I'm at a whopping twenty points for the season. Uh, Bart, I'm going to say 
Unless Deacon bombs. You're on mute, Bart. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, wait, 20 points? Has there been six events or five? Six. Yeah, six. Have you taken last in every one? Pretty close. Oh, that, would be, that would be 24 points, dummy. <laughs> yeah, but like... <laughs> Real close. Like, yeah, I've, like, it's. I haven't finished higher than. Well, you first. have four points off of finishing last in every one, so that means you've been like one better, or maybe taken second once. I went with the gutsy pick in the first event of only picking guys three percent and lower. Oh, Andy, you won. Uh, we'll get to second. I, I got three percent lower. I got third. You guys might be able to catch me. <laughs> but I was stubborn and decided, hey. Screw it. I'm going to go the whole season picking 3% and lower. And it's not working out. So I highly do not recommend to anybody taking that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm at 20. Bart is, we'll get a plus three. Bart is now in the double digits with 10. Wow. And Welcome to the club, one. bud. Yeah. You know, we worked hard to get here. <laughs> <laughs> Deacon oh. is plus two. Again, we're doing golf scoring, which is why we're adding these points. So Bart is still in the lead with 10 points. Deacon is in second with 13. This can Ooh. get interesting here soon. Andy is in third with 17. And I am killing it in the back of the pack with 20. <laughs> Not out of it at 17. Ooh. Might be out of it for first, but I'm not out of it for second. So I'm I'm completely rally time. Wait, did we make was it the winner got something for this? Yeah. Was, okay. We didn't do anything for last though, right? No, thank God. Okay. Otherwise I would not have taken the approach that I did this year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was trying to be creative. Don't be creative, kids. Um it doesn't get you anywhere in life. No. <laughs> are we ready to go to McGunnersville, though? We Let's are. Do it. We are ready. We got the standings updated. We talked about Neely. Lake Gunnersville. Predictions. Hot takes. Hit me. I don't really know how I feel about this event. Just because, like, I was just on Pickwick, and, like, there were still fish on beds. There was a shad spawn going on, and there, there were fish on the way. it's been cold. Yeah, it's been cold. There were fish on the ledges, but they didn't really want to eat. Like they weren't really out there yet. Like, and Pickwick's like the ledge lake, you know. So, I, I don't, I don't know what's going to be going on there with that Alabama spring they've had. And all we know is it's going to rain ten inches the week of it. So, get flooded again. I think. How it'll be one is with a guy that's going to have a plan A, B, and C, and he's going to hit A, B, and C every single day. I think he's going to have something deep. He's going to have something shallow. And he's going to have some yeah. transition. But it's not going to, I don't think one specific pattern is going to win it, especially this time of year, where it's like it's they're right coming off the bed. There might be some late spawners. I don't, I don't know. I don't think there will be late spawners, but like, you know what I mean? It's just like it hasn't been a typical Alabama spring. It's been weird. It's going to be that funky post spawn just getting off of beds. Is there a bluegill spawn somewhere? I think anybody on the final day is going to have a shot to win it. So I believe like there years ago. will be a bluegill spawn, so I think that will help the bite. But Yeah, because right now we're on a new moon, and they usually spawn new and full. Yeah. So – there's going to be a bluegill spawn. There's going to be a shallow bite. Might even be a topwater event, kind of like how Jamie Hartman won in 2019. I think you'll see a frog play. Spook. I think a spook will play heavy if they find that bluegill spawn. Uh-huh. Plopper. Chatterbait. It can be anything. It's going to be a junk yeah. fishing fest. Yeah. I think that's all we can really touch on. I mean, do you guys have any takes on it? No. No. I just think it's going to be – I mean, Gunnersville is always fun to watch because 
That's one of the ones I don't get sick of them going to because they go at different times and different things happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're dinging like crazy over there. Yeah, my text alerts keep going off. I can't. <laughs> you guys keep texting in the group chat. Not... I know. We're making fun of Deacon, but it's all good. Yeah. We're, we're good now. We're good. Um, so I'll kick us off for group A if we're going to dive into fantasy picks because basically – we're chalking this up to just be a junk fishing fest, and whoever can junk the best is going to win. I don't necessarily – it's just going to be a junk fishing fest. I just think there's going to be a lot of different things going on, and guys who excel at those specific specific things will win. I kind of disagree, and they're going to do A, B, and C. Okay. I think they're going to focus on one better than the others, and the others might wear themselves thin and not spend enough time on one thing one day. Fair enough. Andy, what side are you leaning towards? A, a one specific pattern or a multitude? I think it's going to be a multitude of things, but I think it's going to be grass. So I think you're going to see flippers show out, and there might be a dock bite, like mm-hmm. a big time dock bite. See, I don't know how much grass is there because, like, I mean, because Pickwick, of all the high water, the high water, and like, dude, Pickwick barely had any grass when we were there. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So I don't. Like, Gville just has more grass, like flat out, right. all over Gville. I'm gonna text my inside source that lives close to there. But uh, yeah, it's just gonna be an interesting event. It's Gunnersville. It's May. It's there's gonna be cool stuff going on. But I just yeah. think the buckets are really tough to pick in this event. Yeah. Like, they're just weird. Like, you can tell it's time to go up north because you get to take a look <laughs> at certain names and you're like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I get you. Well, dude, for, for Group A, I'm going off of one recency bias um, in, in two spectrums of recency. He just won Neely, and he also killed it at the event last year. It was in, could Had a chance to win the damn thing, but Frank Talley came back and won it. I'm going with Wes Logan for, for Group A. It's a good pack, low value too. Mm-hmm. Which is surprising, to be honest. Yeah. He's at 2.5%, which is granted he's in the same bucket as Fighter Christie, <coughs> as Gerald Swindle, which is surprising. Swindle is up there. There might be a lot of people that might think it's a junk fishing deal, which is why they pick him. But even like Polynex at 5%, Welcher's at 4%, which that could be a sleeper. But yeah, Andy, what do you got for Group A? Matt Heron. I was th- as soon as you mentioned grass, that's like flippers show out. That's where I thought of Heron. And he always tends to do well at Chick Gunnersville. He's pretty close to Gunnersville when it's post spawn grass. Um, I think that's why I also said dock fishery because he's going to go between grass and docks. I had a hard time choosing between him and Jason Christie, though, because the last time I believe the elites fish fish there around the same time of year, Jason Christie was in the top ten throwing a six or an eight inch hollow belly swim bait by hmm. close to one of the bridges, and at eight percent he's pretty low. But I went Matt Heron at one point eight. Bart, I went with. Um, who I thought was kind of an obvious pick. That fighter. I just didn't no, didn't pick him. Um, I picked Buddy Gross. I do think there are going to be some ledge fish and like that type of whatever stuff going on, and there ain't nobody better at doing it than Buddy. He might not win, but he'll be in the top twenty. Mm-hmm. You know, safe, so. safe, good pick who could win. Yeah, he didn't do well, but uh. I will say I think Fighter is a very good pick here. But Just like he he's literally been a good pick everywhere this year. And yeah. now the remainder of the year we go. But like I said too, I don't know how much grass is there this year. So Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out and all in and say that there's probably some good amount of grass. And if there I mean it might even fish but be- the grass might fish better if there is less grass than usual. And like just condense those fish more. Yeah, so if we find grass, and there's gonna be piles of them. True. 
And I, I went, my group B pick was based on, well, my next three picks are essentially are based on if there's going to be grass. Um, group B, uh, he's only at 1.3%, uh, percent, and I went with Hunter Shryock. I think it's an event that he could do well. Based off of my consensus, my theory of it's going to be an A, B, and C type of deal. I think he, he always does, does well at Gunnersville, too, if I remember right. I feel like he does well. He lives on a TVA now. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good pick. So I'm going to go here. I got Matt Airy. He almost won last year if he didn't lose a couple fish at the boat. Um, if they are starting to get in that transition point, I think he's one who's going to be really well with a ton of FLW experience there as well around similar time. Year, so that's my group B pick. Getting up shallow with the wacky rig. I really like that pick. I'm looking back through this group because I don't necessarily know if I want to go with this pick, but I'm going to do it. Um, Len Aries got some confidence rolling too. Just sorry, had to interrupt there. No, you're good. I am going with kind of an abnormal pick here. Uh, I'm going to go with Austin Felix. Riding the hot hand? This isn't necessarily where I pick him, but he's been hot lately. Two top tens in a row and, like, kind of getting things going. And, like, he's a sneaky, really good ledge fisherman. And also, like, we were talking about off air. Like, he always seems to catch them a different way other people are. Or, like, finding something others didn't. Like, he seems to be doing something alone normally, Mm -hmm. which is, like, huge. Yeah. Win. yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I just have this sneaky feeling he'll have a good event. I dig that. I think Aries a really good pick, Andy. I think that could be a good one, especially after because now if you watch Scott Martin's channel, you see him teasing Matt about you know Matt's been not having the greatest season, and you know, I'm sure that top ten is probably feels real freaking good, and he might get back in a stride and could be kind of dangerous. So. I think I think it's a really good one, but my group C pick to go back, like I said, in line with grass fishing, potentially have an A, B, and C. Um, I went with Brian Schmidt. I think he could do pretty well here. What do you guys think? I I thought this bucket was really bad, so like it's hard for me to be like, yeah, I think that's a good pick because like I don't think there is a good pick in this group. <laughs> not, not the recent winner, Mr. Frank Talley. Uh, maybe, but he wanted it such a different time of year, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I I was heavily torn between two. I was going to go either Clark Wenlit, but I ended up going Justin Hamner, another Alabama guy. Had a poor event at Neely Henry. I'm basically probably almost like a home lake for him. So I think he's going to do well at Gunnersville because everybody in Alabama usually does. I think it's a good pick. Yeah. If there's an opportunity for another rookie to do well, I think it was Neely and and Gunnersville. Yeah. I do not have a very great reason for my pick other than I feel like this time of year he tends to do pretty well, and he hasn't been, and – he has to have a good event sooner or later, so I'm just – that's literally it. Um, I'm going to go with Clifford Perch. Under 1%. He has a ton of experience there. Yeah, he's having a really weird year. I had a bad year last year. Mm. Um, it's very abnormal. He's very consistent, like top 40 fisherman, like that 40 to 20 bucket range. Yeah, he's like always in the classic at like the 30th in AOI or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think the last time he was in the top 10 was, what, St. Lawrence last year? Maybe, yeah. He was, I thought he was fishing around Chris, which is why I thought I remember it. Um, let's see, Group D. Uh, I picked him last event. Um, he did well, and obviously he did well at the Classic here last year. Uh, I'm going with Todd Auten in case there is some sort of grass. Throw that chatterbait around. Riding the Auten train, I like it. Yeah, 
I like how Bailey's bold prediction at the beginning of this was that someone was going to need to do several different things in order to do well in this event, and every pick has been based on grass fishing. <laughs> that doesn't mean they can't have to <laughs> the Well, they're going to fish shallow grass, they're going to fish medium-depth grass, and then they're going to fish a bit deeper grass. Mm -hmm. yeah, see, that's it's all going to be in five feet. <laughs> like, that's, the way, that's what I'm hearing right now. <laughs> shallow grass on top water. Medium grass with chatterbait. Yeah. In the deep grass, AVC. Come on, yeah. man. <laughs> Andy, what you got? I'm swinging on Group D. And not because I'm swinging, but because he always does good at Gunnersville. And it's not Paul Mueller. It's going to be Carl Jacobson. Always does good at Gunnersville for whatever reason. Interesting pick. I wanted to go Paul Mueller, but he seems to have one giant bag and then slightly struggle a couple days, and then we'll – I just couldn't go with Paul, and he was too highly owned, so I went with Carl. He just finds a giant school and then just beats the crap out of him on day one, and then yeah. he's like, well, don't have anything well, else for the rest of the days. <laughs> well, no, it's not even that. Like, the day one, he'll catch two fish, and then the second day, he'll drop 26 pounds, and then he'll make the top 50 cut, and day three, he'll catch eight pounds. So it's like Paul Paul is someone total random tangent. Paul is someone that I would love to get in the boat and watch him work his electronics. That would be fascinating. He's he's probably one of the more underrated electronic fishermen in pros right now. At least it's not as talked about or should be talked about. Who you got for group D, Bart? Um I actually same as Andy. Um dude. Carl and Gunnersville get along, and, like, Carl is too good of an angler to be having as bad of a year as he is now. And, like, people look at it and say, oh, he's inconsistent or whatever, but, like, it's been weird his struggles on the elites at times because he qualified for the elites twice. Mm -hmm. Like, he disqualified for the elites and then immediately requalified. Like, yeah, that does like, like, two years later, I think, yeah. he did it. Yeah, he's – and <clears throat> like you were saying, Andy, like FLW, Bass, everything, like he, some of his biggest moments are on Gunnersville. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the FLW tour, he finished, what, AOY top 10, I think? So, yeah. So, I mean, he, he has the ability. Yeah. There, and then um, <clears throat> his monster day, his rookie year, like the one event he – or one of the first events he did really well. He was at Gunnersville. There's – there's a lot of just Gunnersville swag and like mm -hmm. he likes Gunnersville. And the thing is with the way the fish are going to be set up, it's in that weird time frame where Carl does weird things on a weird lake. He's going to throw a football jig on rip wrap and catch 23 pounds. Yeah. Or <laughs> like, and he loves those bridges. Yeah. He loves the bridges out there. Like, as much as we joke, like, this could be an event we see Carl do really well with a glider or a big swim bait, this is legitimately that event. <laughs> and that, that's why I struggled to not pick Jason Christie in Group A because I'm like, if he gets that six- or eight-inch hollow belly bike going, he can yeah. blow the doors right off of it. And it's that weird time of year where that hollow belly bike could kick up. And that's where um, I, I almost picked Clint Davis. That was the other one. I don't know. Clint's just always kind of good out there, yeah. but it's a boring pick, so I went with Carl. I think Clint's the more like Clint's the safer pick. Carl is he might make the top ten, or he might come in ninety first. Exactly. So Group E, like we've talked about, probably the past three events is easily the most hard, the most difficult bucket. I didn't know who the hell to pick, uh, so I went. I just went off of, hopefully, some sort of superstition of I haven't been picking him because I don't want him to do bad and inflict my picks, which means they're probably gonna do bad. Hopefully, this means he'll do good. Uh, I'm going with Mr. Destin Demarion. We'll see how he how he does at the old Gville. Oh, no other reason beyond that, Andy. Um, I went with Mike Huff for no reason. I just, I feel like he's having a weird year and he's due for a good finish. So I'm going to go Mike Huff. Almost one chick. 
by you, Bart? Um, I feel like I picked him a lot, and that's I'm just gonna pick him again, even though he hasn't really done that great all year. But uh, eventually, he's gonna catch him because he's so really good. Is Daryl Gleason? I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah. I think I've picked Daryl to every event. Well, we need to go back and see how many times I've actually picked Daryl. You've picked him a, at least four. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go look. <laughs> I know it was the last I'll event. I'll count him up for you. Was it last event you caught that you picked him? Yep. He definitely picked him at Neely Henry and Pickwick. No, not no, Neely Pickwick. Henry. I got like, him at four. Pickwick. Four. Sabine. Sabine. Okay, not Pickwick. I thought you had him at Pickwick. Nope. So you're at three. So you're at fifty percent. What was it? I said Sabine Lake Fork. It was Sabine and Lake Fork. Now we're at Lake Gunnersville. This is a seven. So we're under fifty percent. Okay. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Bad math. <laughs> I was still thinking of round six. Yeah, no. So I'm going with Daryl. I, I I don't know. All right. He's good. He he is a really, really, really good rookie. And, like, it's just been surprising not seeing him have his event yet because he, he's, like, a very well-known opens pro. He kind of just didn't randomly show up, you know? Right. All right. Let's, so, uh, so we got those picks in. I don't think – obviously, we don't have – Deacon's picks, um, but obviously people will know his once we do um, the preview show for Lake Champlain. Uh, we'll have Deacon go over his picks when we talk about the update in fantasy fishing. Um, but let's hear what you have for winning weight and then also your gut feeling pick. Who someone you haven't obviously someone you haven't picked that you think just for no reason but just might win the damn thing. Andy, you want to go first? Uh, I have 78 pounds and 12 ounces, and my gut pick, and I announced it before, and I didn't choose him in Group A. He's going to be Jason Christie. I think he's going to get a second win if that six- to eight-inch hollow belly bite turns on on day four, and he just runs into a big school of them. Why you, Bart? I'm trying to figure out who my gut pick would be because I don't think I really have one. Um, I'll go for you while you you browse that. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Go ahead. For winning weight, I picked 92.7. I picked that because I think there will be 17 to 18 a day with a 22 in there. That's what I'm going on. I think they're going to catch him pretty good. Um, And my gut pick uh, don't know why, but like seeing his name, it just kind of like, like, huh? I think it could happen because the docks docks could be the winning pattern. And there's a mayfly hatch coming. Interesting top water. Um, I'm gonna a gut feeling is Ed Lockard. I don't know why when there's these weird tournaments like there, he just seems to sneak in the top ten like Santee Cooper. Weird tournament snuck in the top ten. I don't know. So I just want to end locker. Bart. Okay. Uh, weight. I had not nearly as high. I had 85.14. Um, I think it'll be over 20 pounds a day, but uh, not that much over. It's like you must bust, might bust 25 one day and then sit, you know, 18 one day and then 20, 20. I think it'll be 20 pounds, a little over 20 pounds a day. And then uh, I'm just going to honestly stick with, like, I'm not backing out of this for this one, but, like, I don't have a gut feeling pick for this event, and that's why I think I'm really excited to watch it, is um, you're at Gunnersville at a time of year where there's a lot of different things going on, and, like, legitimately the top ten you could look at and, you're like, oh, this is who's here. Um, so that, but if I had to pick one, it's I just keep saying Seth Fighter. <laughs> nah, he isn't my gut feeling pick here, but he's gonna win Champlain. So, really fast, I know we're recording this late. 
I'm just I'm just gonna either blame it on that or my just me being really bad at math. Uh, but for some reason, I said 17 to 18 a day with 122 in there, which does not even come close to 92 pounds. That's 76. <laughs> well, I'm just a dumbass. I'm just gonna call it as it is. Yeah, yeah no, I, you said there, that bud. and I let it go by, but I was like, he was at 92. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, actually, well, I'm I'm changing mine back to what I had it before you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is 76, 7, not 92. Okay, mine's 82, 14. Yikes. Yikes. Overall, net general, same vicinity. I think it. I think the average is, yeah, like that, pounds a day. 17 to 19, two days, and then you're going to have a big bag, and then right around 20. So you're going to have to have one, like, 22 to 25-pound bag, a 20-pound bag, and then 16 to 18 the other two days to have a shot to win. That's usually how it goes, right. usually. So you have to have a big fish every day. True. It'll be interesting. It'll be fun to watch just because the uncertainty of us Northerners not knowing what g feels setting up like right now. But – that should be fun. I think there's uh, a lot of things going on. Like, there's been a shad spawn for the last however many events. Forever. Uh, yeah. Like the longest shad spawn shad of life. Spawn going on. Yeah. It's just a th like, I joke forever how a shad spawn wasn't a thing. And, like, this year, it's just like, it's a, evidently the only pattern. <laughs> um, so that might be going on. You got ledges on Gunnersville. You got bridges. You got grass. You got docks. Like you just all the halfway stuff. A ton of fish in it. Yeah. Unlike I actually Henry. <laughs> to go back to the Carl, like the Carl Jackson point, uh, two years ago in 2019 when they went there, he was like one of the only guys on a bluegill pattern. He was catching. I I want to say on a swim jig on a bluegill pattern. If I remember watching live. Because I think they had him on live one day. Yeah, he he just gets along with that lake. I, I'm not picking him as my gut pick because I don't know if I'd gut pick him to, like, win. But, like, I like I really think he's going to be in the top ten this event. And just, like, his mentality. And I think he's kind of close to that area of getting cut from the elites again. And, like, I know he doesn't want to have to re – to do that obviously nobody does but like i believe Carl's a guy who can actually do something about that I don't you know think he's that close is he i think he's pretty close because well, he had a really good year last year he's in the classic isn't he yeah but not this year well it's he's, two uh, years combined oh it is yeah okay never mind he's at 76 so he's kind yeah, of he's almost to the bubble he's close yeah, but it's the average of last year and this year. He's probably in like the forties. Because I think he was in like the top thirty last year. Hmm. Well, don't remember. Any other uh, takeaways from Gville before we wrap this thing up? No, I can't. I, is it going to get won by Goose Pond or down on the other part of the lake? What Browns? Yeah, like down in that region, you know. It's always one of the two. Yeah, it's rarely <laughs> any, unless it's Frank Talley in the fall way yeah. up the river, and you're like, wait a second, you can fish the river on Gunnersville. <laughs> you might see people go up there this time though. Now that it's been, now that they're like, oh, one tournament was one up there. Now we have to go check. I think the cool part is when we watch live, everyone is going to be doing something different. Unless it's Brandon Lester and Matt Airy fishing 20 feet from each other on the same road bed. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, everyone's going to be doing something different. You'll have guys chatterbaiting, throwing crankbaits. You'll have guys fishing a jig, flipping grass, fishing docks. Like, it's going to be a fun event to watch. I can't wait for Thursday. Yeah. I'm excited because this is the first, like, elite series event. I'm going to get to, like, sit at my house and watch. You'll not be fishing. Like, you play or something. I won't be fishing or like anything. I can sit down and like just watch it. <sighs> Heck yeah, dude. Yeah, the only day I can't watch is Saturday because I have another guide trip. So, okay. Thank you, yeah, boys. It's starting to get busy. Well, dudes, we're going to wrap it up here. 
Uh, I'm sure we're all ready for bed right now. Thank you guys for taking the time to get this cranked out for the folks. I know it was weird timing. Um, that's all on me from this past week. It's been hectic. Um, Welcome but, uh, home. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Um, but we're looking forward to another week getting back on the ground for the podcast. I know it's a Sunday night upload, but uh, looking forward to Lake Gunnersville. So, uh, as always, folks, we appreciate it. We'll see you guys tomorrow night for Monday Night Live.